Hello again. We're still sitting here with the coronavirus stuck inside. I'm in Vancouver. We're in the same thing, uh, social distancing. Most businesses are closed. Uh, only the essential things open. If you go to the grocery store, you got to stand six feet apart in line on dots on the floor, all that stuff. I said at the end of my previous video that I would be doing a commentary on Genesis chapter 48 and 49, which is the next uh, part in our Bible study, and that is a, a study of prophecy. And as I've said many times already, uh, the book of Genesis is like a table of contents for the rest of the Bible. And for prophecy, it's no different. So when we start looking at uh, Israel and Jacob's prophecies over his children, he's prophesying over what the nations that come from his children will end up being. And some of them are, are quite far-reaching prophecies. And so it's very important for us to take a look at this and because it sort of is a unfolding of all the other prophecies that come after it. And the book of Genesis is kind of a hard thing in this regard that it's telling the end times from the beginning. And so for a lot of it, you have to look forward and then come back to it. And later on, maybe refer back to it. Because it's like, it's like the table of contents. It, it told you things that you're not really going to understand until you study a lot of other things later. And I thought that before we dive into this, because um, it can get quite complicated and quite involved, this is why we've already studied, I did a series on Ephraim and Manasseh, which is very important for, our, our, for Genesis chapter 48, which will be my next video. And I also did a series on Judah and um, those two basically are very important for our next few videos on studying these two chapters. But I thought it prudent before I get into um, Genesis chapter 48 that we go over some, basically a summary of world history. Um, now this is my opinions. Um, I'm not going to provide a lot of proof or anything or even scriptures because it would just be too long and a lot of work. But I'd like to lay out sort of what I've come up with in my studies over the years on what is what is going on here and what is shown through prophecy. And um, I, I thought that I would go over it right now before we start our study of prophecy uh, through Israel and Jacob. And this one I'm calling History Repeats Itself. And I made some point forms on my paper here so that I don't get lost in the subject while I'm talking about it. Uh, for, first of all, the true church of God. You always find all the churches, or every church claims to be the true church of God. And they all claim that all others are not. Because there is only one church. One church, one faith, and one baptism. Um, what the true church really is, is it's God's people scattered all over the place, all over the world. He knows who they are, and they know who He is. And they are guided by the Holy Spirit. So it's the ones who carry the Holy Spirit and who are guided by the Holy Spirit are God's church. And people say, well, how can you be organized? How can they be organized? They're organized by the Holy Spirit. And it's not a, a, a building that you go to. It's not a group of men that you go join with these leaders that are men. 
the leader of it is the Holy Spirit, which is one of the persons of God. So that is the true church. Um, when if you say, well, like you can be going to church and be a part of the church. Uh, personally, I don't get much from going to church. It, it's it's uh, just not my thing. Um, but some people do, and that that I know that I would uh, call them a part of the church. They're they're in every walk of life. Um, so, but when you go to church, they kind of their attitude is that if you're not part of our church and you're not a member of our church, then you're not in the church. And then they come up with the line, oh, don't forsake the gathering of the people of God. Well, the way I look at it is if I come to your church for fellowship and you tell me I'm not a Christian and I'm not a part of the church, then you are the one forsaking the gathering of the people of God, not me. And that this is one of the many problems I have going to church. So I don't really go to church, but some people do. It's, it's really a personal choice. Um, but I certainly wouldn't condemn somebody for not going. And I wouldn't condemn somebody that goes to any certain church. Um, you know, you'll hear me speak a lot against the Roman Catholic papacy. And people confuse that with me speaking against Roman Catholic people. I don't condemn Roman Catholic people because a lot of them are just, they're, they're good people and they just don't understand um, what they are doing or what they are following. And, but it doesn't stop me from pointing out the many evils of the higher echelons of the papacy and the Vatican. And I'll continue to point that out because the Bible points it out. And um, this doesn't necessarily condemn the Catholic people themselves, but it condemns the thing that they support. Um, it's almost like, okay, Adolf Hitler, he was an evil man. Does this make all the Germans, every single German, evil? No. They were fooled by Adolf Hitler. And so they were fooled into helping him in his evil. But they weren't evil. They were just fooled by him. So it's the same kind of thing. Okay, next point. Um, okay, now time is divided by the uh, before Christ and after Christ. And prophecy is also divided in several ways. Um, there's the first and the second advent of Christ. Um, this is where Jews tend to stumble because they're looking for one Messiah to come once. But when you read the Messianic prophecies, you will see that um, there's actually two appearances of the Messiah. And Christ fulfilled the first part of the prophecies, but there's a second part of the prophecy. In the first part, he comes to reveal his message and to die for sinners and to um, accomplish this it's a conquering of sin, a conquering of the evil forces. And this, this gives God the complete prerogative over all evil. And then in the second coming is where he comes to judge the living and the dead and, and the final judgment and the final uh, consummation of everything. So prophecy is very much like that. It, it, it's, it's overlaid and overlaid and overlaid. Um, now, history is also overlaid, the, the way prophecy is. And um, there's a baptism 
everything is, is there's a, a baptism, a death, and a resurrection. Just like Christ was baptized, died, and resurrected, you will find that almost everything God is involved in involves a baptism, death, and resurrection. And there's also two baptisms. There's a baptism of water and a baptism of fire. Now in the New Testament, the baptism of water was preached by John the Baptist where they were actually dipped in water and in the river. But it was a symbolic baptism which symbolized the baptism of fire. And that was when the tongues of fire came upon the apostles and they received the Holy Spirit. Um, the baptism of fire is the baptism of the Holy Spirit where the Holy Spirit comes and cleanses your soul uh, of evil deeds and evil thoughts and, and it's the purging, the, the, as I spoke before, like the refining of silver and gold. That's the baptism of fire. Now, in world history, uh, the Bible is a record of the history of ancient Israel, which begins with the creation and Noah and Moses, and it ends with the revelation, and which is a prophecy of everything that would happen after Jesus Christ. So it ends with the death and resurrection of Christ, and then after that is given the revelation, and also some um, letters written by the apostles, letters of instruction that they left for us. So the story of the Bible is basically, the main bulk of it is the story of ancient Israel and how it began and how it ended. And there's a principle in the Bible of since God's people had to go through it, all people have to go through it. So when we look at the history of ancient Israel, we, we see this, uh, this uh, baptism of water, this baptism of fire, and the death and resurrection that continually happens. And then when we look at Christian history, it's like a repetition of that same story because uh, Christianity is Israel. If you uh, looked at my, my video series on Ephraim and Manasseh, that explains biblically with scripture how Christianity represents Israel. Uh, it's a replacement of the what used to be the northern kingdom of Israel, also known as Ephraim. So, the history of ancient Israel is repeated by the history of after Christ Israel, or Christianity. So, let's take a quick look at this history. Um, it starts out with the corruption in Egypt. Um, the, the, the people of Israel stayed in Egypt and they, they, they learned Egyptian religion and Egyptian ways and they were corrupted by it. They had pretty much forgotten most of what uh, their forefather Israel and Jacob had taught them and Abraham and Isaac and they um, had Egyptian customs. And then the, the baptism of water was Moses coming and giving them the law and leading them through the Red Sea where the Red Sea parted. This symbolizes the baptism of water and where they left Egypt behind and they were given the set of laws and customs and a system of government for Israel and led into the promised land. So that was the baptism. And then when they were in the promised land, then now, now that Moses was a deliverance from slavery, the, uh, the slavery in Egypt. 
Okay, then they become corrupt in the, in the promised land, which we covered in the series of, about Ephraim. Uh, we talked a lot about the judges and how the judges um, did not follow the ways of Moses. They, they did uh, things that corrupted the teachings of Moses. For example, Gideon. Gideon made a silver ephod and placed it in his house and people came to his house to worship the silver ephod. Things like that. They were corruptions of the true the truth of God. And there were several of those. And um, then the people asked for a king. And God gave them first King Saul, who was kind of a wicked king. But he did, uh, did unite the military of Israel. And then uh, God gave the kingdom to David, who is like a representative of the Christ as king. He's a representative of the Messiah. Uh, the Messiah is said to sit on the throne of David. So this was a deliverance from war because when David took the throne, Israel had conquered all, their, all of their enemies and they were relaxed for more. And then it was a consolidation of Israel's power. And then David's son Solomon took over. And that's when Israel became divided into two nations. So there's another corruption. Solomon had so many wives and all of his wives led him and led Israel to follow after foreign gods. And, and there was a corruption of division and Israel was divided between the southern kingdom of Judah and the northern kingdom of Israel. And the, God sent the prophets at this time, and the prophets were generally ignored by the majority of people. Now, during all these times, there had always been God's people who were a small segment of the people who really did understand the truth and did follow the truth. But the general population was always going corrupt. So during these times, it's not like there was no real church. There always was. It's just not being described here. The corruption of the general nation of Israel is being described. And then after the prophets were ignored, there was a destruction by Assyria and by Babylon. And that is a, a precursor to the judgment. Because there was a judgment where the northern kingdom of Israel was sent into slavery forever. And the southern kingdom of, Israel, of, the southern kingdom of Judah was sent into slavery for 70 years and brought back for David's sake, not for their own sake, because they were no better than the northern kingdom, but they were brought back to continue on the history that the promise given to David might be fulfilled, to carry on prophecy, that the prophecies might be fulfilled. So this was the reason they were brought back. It wasn't because they were so good, because they weren't. Okay, and then there's the baptism of fire, okay? So Judah is restored for David's sake. And they were delivered and, and allowed to return to the homeland under Persia. After the, the empire of Persia had conquered Babylon, the Persians allowed them to come back, okay? Then they became a corrupt, corrupted again when the Greeks conquered the Middle East under Alexander the Great, it began the Hellenistic era. And during, during the Hellenistic era, the Jews um, were forced to follow Greek religion and to worship Greek gods and to adapt to Greek customs. So they again became corrupt. But then the Maccabees revolted 
And the Maccabees conquered the Greeks and threw them threw off their yoke and they actually forced the Jews to take to return to the law of Moses. And through the Maccabees there was a a baptism of fire, if you will, where they were actually they left the truth and they were brought back into it. Uh, they were purified with, from within. And um, then they were again corrupted after that by the Herodian dynasty who took over the leadership of the Judea and they were the Edomite rulers. Um, this is spoken about quite a bit in my series about Ephraim and the series about, uh, there's a series about Edom, which covers this in great detail, the, the Edomite rulership of the Herodian dynasty. And then the judgment from that came after they, uh, okay, the prophet came, John the Baptist, and he was ignored. Just as during the ancient times, the prophets like Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel were ignored. Okay. And then there came the, the destruction by Rome. The destruction of Jerusalem. And the disbursement of the Jews. So during this judgment, uh, which is under Jesus Christ now, unbelievers are rejected. Judah and Ephraim are reunited into one people who are Christians. Because the, the first Christians were Jews and then the Gentile Christians were prophetically referred to as Ephraim. Okay? And then they were, they were promised a future restoration, which is the second coming of Christ. Uh, that, that was their promise. So now that is the ancient kingdom of Israel and how things went. It went overturned two times. There was a baptism of water and the baptism of fire. And each time there was a corruption, a deliverance, corruption, deliverance, and a consolidation of power which the second time would have been on through the resurrection and the joining of Judah and Ephraim. That's the consolidation of power. And then the prophets ignored and the destruction and the judgment. So that happened twice under the ancient kingdom of Israel, uh, ending, all culminating in the destruction of the second temple. And it's basically the first and the second temple periods. The first temple period, starting with Moses, being the baptism of water, and then the second second te temple period being the baptism of fire. Now Christianity went through similar phases in history, where history repeats itself. Uh, now the baptism of water, okay, the deliverance of Moses is repeated by the deliverance of Christ where now it's a deliverance from the slavery to sin. So he's overcoming the power of evil. And through baptism, you are escaping the slavery of sin because you're accepting the Holy Spirit. So now you used to be a slave to sin and now you're a slave to the Holy Spirit who is going to purify you through adversity and sometimes persecution. Okay, so then uh, the corruption came in. Okay, this was the first 300 years of Christianity. Um, once the apostles um, all died off and it lasted maybe another generation or two when a lot of... Uh, even during the apostles' time, there was a lot of heresies 
uh, people coming out with different gospels, different interpretations than what the, the apostles were telling. And it was the apostles were ordained to tell the gospel. So they were the authority on what is the gospel, on, on telling the story of Jesus. They wrote the gospels and they wrote the epistles. So there was a few generations of uh, church fathers who followed it very closely. And there was also a few generations of heretics who came out with different gospels and new gospels and crazy gospels and all kinds of weird stuff. And this was a time of great persecution um, there was, I think, ten persecutions under the Roman Empire. Uh, it happened at different frequencies and different uh, times. And the, uh, Christianity was basically outlawed because they refused to recognize the gods of Rome. And that was basically against the law in Rome. And it was uh, basically condemned universally in Rome. Plus they were closely associated to Jews. So after the Jewish-Roman wars, um, they also were condemned for being too much like Jews. And Christians began to adapt customs that were further away from Judaism. So that was the uh, another corruption of Christianity. It, the corrupt Christians began to grow more and more. And um, so then, uh, then the, there was a deliverance from persecution. Now this is like a two-edged sword because it came when the birth of the Roman Catholic Church. Ca the word Catholic means universal. So the Emperor Constantine the Great in the year 325 adapted Christianity as an, not the official religion of Rome, an official religion of Rome. It, it was like, it's no longer against the law. It is okay to be a Christian now. And the... It comes back to explaining what the pontiff is. The, the Roman emperor was the pontiff. And that's like the high priest. Every, um, they had the, um, what was it called? I can't remember the name of it, but it was basically a, a, a big um, theater that had a rep representation of every Roman god. And the, uh, each god had a priest, an official priest who was paid for and designated by the emperor. And the, the, each priest was responsible for making sure that each of those gods was appeased on behalf of the empire so that the Roman Empire was being taken care of as far as the gods were concerned. And if there was any problem with the gods, the priest of that god would approach the pontiff, who was the Roman emperor, who was like the high priest of all the other priests. And he would, this is the pontificate, how it originally worked. Okay, so then the emperor was like the high priest and each priest took care of a god. So Christianity was allowed into this pontificate by Constantine. And Constantine's mother was a Christian and Constantine professed Christianity, although he didn't actually... Um, practice it in his own life he professed it and he claimed victory in battle through Christ so 
This obviously made Christianity very popular among the elite classes of Rome. And it became so popular that all of Rome soon became Christian. Um, there was a general, um, not really a throwing off of the Roman gods, was the Roman gods were slowly becoming saints and they were slowly taking on Christian names like Jude and Peter and John and James. The, these all started to become worshipped like demagogues. And this was never biblical at all. In the Bible, there is only one God and he is the only one wor worthy of worship. He is the only one worthy of praise and prayer. So he is the only one to be approached in prayer. So this is totally unbiblical, but it's along the lines of what Romans practiced. And so they didn't really um, become Christians and start reading the Gospels in order to please God. They became Christians in order to please the emperor. So this is how Roman Catholicism was born. Now they claim their ties all the way back to Peter, but there is no connection between the Roman Emperor Constantine and the Apostle Peter. Um, the, the first council of Nicaea um, which they called the Second Ecumenical Council, was presided over by the Roman Emperor, Constantine. Not by a Pope. He, uh, the Pope, there was no Pope. Constantine was the Pontiff because he is the Roman Emperor. There was a Bishop of Rome and there were also other Bishops. It was later on that the Bishop of Rome took on a leading role among bishops. So at this time, the Roman Emperor was the Pope, Pontiff. Okay, now, so that's how the, that is the, the corruption during the time of the, um, kingdom under Constantine and, it, and it's also a consolidation of Christianity because what they did was they had these councils and they decided upon certain questions and they decided upon what books were acceptable and what books were heresy and they, they, there was so much confusion in Christianity that Constantine uh, ha held these councils to lay down what is Christianity and who is a Christian. And they defined it under their council. And then from then on, they began to persecute anyone who disagreed with them. So they did get some of it right, but they didn't get all of it right. And the Christians who protested against this were opposed by Rome and they were wiped out and there were some books that were banned that should not have been banned the book of Enoch for example is quoted extensively by the apostles it's alluded to very much by Jesus Christ but we have no reliable copies left because in the fourth century it was uh, it was a forbidden book and it was destroyed um, so bragging about making the Bible well there's a failure right there a big one and the books that they collected into the biblical canon um, they collected the Apocrypha along with it which are not really considered canonical books as truth from God prophets they are considered historical books. 
So they collected that together, but they considered them holy books as well. Um, so when they brag about making the Bible, they didn't make the Bible. They, they assembled the books of the Bible into the first assembly of the Bible, but they screwed it up pretty good. So there's nothing to brag about for that. And then they proceeded to basically murder the first Christians who did not go along with some of their beliefs. And uh, they also murdered a lot of heretics. So this is sort of a, a, a two-edged sword. And it's like the... the um, it goes along with the same time as the consolidation of the kingdom of Israel under Saul and David, uh, where it's good and it's bad. It's it's a necessary thing, and but it's a very difficult time. Okay, so then uh, after that consolidation of power under Constantine, the Roman emperor. Then there came a corruption of division. And this is when uh, the Roman Emperor Constantine, he moved the capital of Rome from Rome to Constantinople. So for hundreds of years, Rome had been the capital city and the center of the Roman Empire. Now it was Constantinople, which today is Istanbul, Turkey. Um, but at that time it was named Constantinople and that was the Eastern Empire of Rome. Um, when Rome split between East and West, it was split between the city of Rome and the city of Constantinople. But what happened was the, uh, uh, the Bishop of Rome started to take on filling in the power vacuum that Constantine had left behind in Rome. And he uh, basically, because of his, um, his desire for power, he, the, the church split between Rome and Constantinople. And this was the great schism between the Eastern and Western Christianity. Um, there was also an African and a Syrian division of Christianity, but they were wiped out pretty early on by the Muslim invasions, and it left behind the Eastern and Western Christianity. So there's the, 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 the division, the corruption of division, okay? And now... During this corruption of division, under Solomon, the prophets were ignored. So under this papacy and Eastern Church, okay, so how are the prophets ignored under this? Well, during the time when the, the Bishop of Rome held power, um, there was the Byzantine Empire in the East, and they had uh, the Bishop of Constantinople and they had bishops in Antioch in Syria, and they held their collection of books, and the Bishop of Rome had their collection of books. And now the the in the East they spoke Greek, so they had no reason to to translate the books that they had collected, uh, but the Romans in, in the West, they translated the books into Latin, which eventually became the Latin Vulgate Bible. Uh, in the East, they, they had their Greek books. Now, the Greek language had adapted, as languages do through history, so their language had changed somewhat, and as they copied the Greek manuscripts, the manuscripts had been updated as well into the more modern language. So what happened later on 
was the uh, when when Islam invaded all and took the Byzantine Empire, they eventually took the city of Constantinople, and when that happened, the Byzantine Empire fell, and the scholars from the Eastern Church fled into Europe. And when they fled into Europe, they brought their Greek manuscripts with them. And this is where a man named Erasmus started looking at these manuscripts, and he noticed the big difference between the Greek manuscripts and the Latin manuscripts, that it became quite apparent that the Latin Vulgate had been altered to agree with the bishops of Rome and their teachings. And he was the first one to sort of point this out. And uh, Martin Luther had also been um, reading the Gospels, and he wasn't the first one, but he was the first one to be widely recognized. Uh, he was actually a... Roman Catholic priest and scholar. He was uh, put over the University of Wittenberg and uh, he had a big problem with indulgences which was basically selling tickets to heaven. Uh, the church using their power and the ignorance of the people. The, the general people didn't know anything about the Bible. They completely believed everything the priest told them. Uh, they couldn't read, let alone read Latin or understand Latin. They only knew their native languages like German or French or English or Swiss or whatever country they were in. Um, very few people knew the Bible at all because they were being taught catechisms and the Catholic sacraments, and that's it. And they had no access to the Bible. Now Martin Luther, he had access to the Bible, and he read the epistles and the Gospels, and he saw the, the difference between what the Gospel was teaching and what the Church was teaching. And he set out to reform the Church, to tell them, you are not teaching the Gospel and you need to start changing the way you're teaching. And this put him at odds with the Pope. Um, so he started to, uh, him and others started to pick up on these falsehoods and these problems with what was being taught. And along with that came the, inv the invention of movable type in the printing press. So this gave the reformers the ability to print multiple books uh, from one printing press. It, it revolutionized printing. Before it could take two years to write one Bible. Now they could print off 200 of them in a couple of, in six months. So that was the difference, all the difference in bringing the Bible to the people and Martin Luther was going completely against the Pope. When, after he was excommunicated, he translated the Bible, starting with the New Testament, into German. And others um, were translating it into their languages, into English. There was uh, one, an older one in English uh, by a man named Wycliffe, and uh, there was Calvin, who was also translating. And there was a lot of people working on different translations because the people were eager to know what God's holy book actually says. And it was basically illegal to, to translate it because it was seen as... Uh, Latin being the holy language, which the original manuscripts were actually Greek, but this was a Roman thing, right? 
where Latin was the holy language, Rome was the holy city. They had things like, oh, the stairs that Jesus walked up in Jerusalem were magically transferred from Jerusalem to Rome before Rome destroyed Jerusalem. Um, it was medieval um, wives' tales and myths about the Bible and about Christianity. And so these were the prophets. These, these were the people who were reading the manuscripts and translating the manuscripts of the gospel and the letters of the apostles, basically the New Testament, and telling the people what it says, and not only telling them, but publishing it in their own language for those who could read and educating them on what the Bible actually says. So this brought many people at odds with the Vatican in Rome because the Vatican was basically teaching things that made itself in control of everybody and that it had complete control over everybody from the birth until death from their baptism at birth until their final last rites at death the 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 church had complete control over all of europe um, now they gained this control through a man named charlemagne charlemagne was a german king uh, who basically the in 800 the year 800 a.d the Pope crowned him as uh, emperor of the Holy Roman Empire. So he made him the new Roman emperor. And, and, and Charlemagne basically went out and conquered all of Europe. Um, Europe was, there was a lot of paganism basically. The pagans of Europe had overthrown the Roman Empire in many ways. It was greatly weakened by the Muslim invasions where the armies of the East were conquered um, in Constantinople and Rome was left vulnerable and before the Muslims could come the pagans of Europe who all hated Rome basically came down and did took what they wanted. Um, so Charlemagne was sent out and he conquered all the pagans in Europe and Christianized them. He forced them into Christianity. They literally marched them through a river, baptizing them and making them Christians. And anyone who refused was killed. And then they enslaved them to the sacraments of the Pope. And this had been from 800 until the time of Martin Luther, which was uh, 1517. So 700 years they had, over 700 years they had enslaved, they had basically enslaved all of Europe to the catechisms of Rome. And now that these new documents came in from Constantinople, um, it revolutionized Europe. Um, it started what was known as the Protestant Reformation, where people were reading the Bible themselves, the New Testament mainly, because um, it was such a big job just to translate the New Testament that they started, this is what they started with. And they didn't have a perfect understanding of it, but they were reading things that spoke to their hearts and they were reading things that said what they've been doing to us is completely wrong and this is totally against what Jesus Christ is talking about so this revolutionized Europe and reformed instead of reforming the church it reformed the people and the people began to stand against the church and now the church treated this as heresy and there was a, a lot of persecution the inquisition would condemn people 
And people were burned at the stake. People were boiled in oil. People were drawn and quartered. It was basically the typical punishments of the day. And reading the Bible was illegal. And publishing the Bible was illegal. And disagreeing with the Pope was illegal. So they fought this. So this was the prophets being ignored during this time in the Reformation. Okay. And the things um, that the Protestants, the main things, there was three main things that they had a contention with. The first was penance versus repentance. In penance, you are always sinning, and then you pay for your sins. Like you say some prayers, you go to confession, the priest, or t priest tells you, well, say some prayers, or if you go visit this monument, or if you go to Rome, or if you offer something to Mary, some incense, or let the priest do something for you, it pays for your sin. Where the um, justification in the Bible is that Jesus pays for your sins. And but having faith and believing in Jesus uh, opens that justification to you as a believer. So it's completely different than what Rome was doing. Rome was doing a very physical thing and a very um, thing that brought money into the church because you could pay to have your sins forgiven through indulgences um, or another indulgence the Rome uh, the Pope would put out an edict and say oh there is a new monument built in such a such a city and anybody who visits this monument will get all of his sins forgiven for the next year and so everybody would go there and of course there was a big market around it um, things like this were being done and the other one was transubstantiation where um, this this came a little bit later where, where they started to study the Bible a bit deeper and uh, they came to find that the teaching of transubstantiation was an error um, transubstanti transubstantiation is still believed by the papacy where the priest does his mass and his ritual and they believe that the host and the wine actually become the body and blood of Jesus like really become the body and blood of Jesus where it is magically transformed because Jesus said whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood uh, you cannot you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood. Now he was speaking symbolically, but they were taking it literally, and they believed the only way this can be done is through the ritual done by the priest of the Roman Catholic Church, and nobody else can do it except them. Um, now the people studying the scriptures of the New Testament, they found that this is actually not the case. This is um, symbolic references made by Jesus that believing in his death and resurrection was a symbolic partaking in his body and blood. And also partaking in persecution is related to that. So... Um, this was a contention between Protestants and Catholics over transubstantiation. Whether it's literally done by the priest or whether it's symbolically done. Uh, Protestants also have a uh, communion but where they use uh, grape juice and unleavened bread which symbolizes, in, in Protestant circles it's very much symbolic and they have a, a, a special, usually a monthly uh, feast together of, uh, they call it a love feast, where they have the bread and wine together, 
but it's doing it in remembrance of Jesus. It, it's a, a symbolic reference. Um, in the Catholic Mass, it literally becomes the body and blood of Jesus, like a magic transformation by the ritual of the Mass. So <clears throat> these are some of the big differences. So that's the prophets being ignored. Now, I call them prophets because they were reading the Bible, right? They were preaching the word of God. The papacy was fighting against the word of God. They said, well, that doesn't really matter anymore. The church is the authority and what we say goes and nobody's allowed to read it anyway. So the Protestants were like, well, actually we're printing it so everybody can read it. And what it says is not the same as what you're doing. So we believe the Bible more than we believe you. Or we believe what Jesus said more than we believe what you said. And this was what it was about. Okay, so this is why I refer to the reformers as the symbolizing the prophets, right? Okay, now... So then the, during the, the Reformation, okay, part of the Reformation, okay, 1517 was when Martin Luther basically kicked off the Reformation. This also kicked off the Hundred Years' War in Germany. Um, this, is, this is sort of like what divides Germany from Austria. They don't like to talk about it. Uh, a lot of history is especially European history, the people get offended by all this stuff. But that was basically Protestants and Catholics. The, the Lutherans are the German North and the Catholics were the Austrian South. And that was a hundred years war that uh, went on for a hundred years. <laughs> and it ended by a stalemate, basically. And uh, war with Britain also, with England. Um, Henry VIII wanted a divorce from his wife. His, I think it was his eighth wife. Um, he kept killing them. Uh, and he wanted to divorce her, and the Pope refused. So he started his own church, the Church of England. And... Um, of course, this put him at odds with the papacy... And he turned to the Protestants because they were all too eager to start a different church in England. And so this started uh, wars in England. When a new, a new uh, king or queen would take over, if they were a Protestant, they would kill the Catholics. And if they were a Catholic, they would kill the Protestants. And this went back and forth in England for another few hundred years. Uh, there's great atrocities that happen on both sides. Um, but anyway, so Henry VIII, he established the Church of England, which uh, many know today as the Anglican Church. Um, but in England, they'll call it the Church of England. In America, it's called the Anglican Church uh, because Anglican is actually a Latin word for English. And the... Um, the, the, the papacy who opposed the Church of England called them the Anglican. And the Church of Eng the British called it the Church of England. Um, but in America, what happened was during the uh, War of Independence in USA, when the Americans were throwing off the British, and they would say, what church are you? They didn't want to say Church of England, so they said Anglican. And they said, oh, England, okay, as long as you're not the Church of England, right? So that's why in America it's, they're known as Anglican, but that's the, the same thing as the Church of England. It's just a, a different name for it that everybody quickly adapted during the War of Independence. And it caught on in Canada as well. And, 
Canada is it's referred to as the Anglican Church. Okay, so then uh, in 1545, the Council of Trent was convened. Now, the, the Council of Trent, let's see, when was the... Uh, in 1540, the Jesuit order was established by Ignatius Leola, and he had fought in the uh, Spanish wars with the Muslims, I think, and uh, he was a great military general, and he became a uh, like a military. He he started like a military order to wipe out Protestants. That was, it's called the Counter-Reformation. Um, this was what, how the, why the Jesuit order was established to do a long-term plan, or short-term if possible, but it turned into a long-term plan to um, turn back Protestants to the Roman Catholic Church and to wipe out all memory of Protestant teachings that they hated as heresy. And so that started, that order was established in 1540, and then five years later, the Pope convened what's called the Council of Trent. Um, before this council, there was no written... Roman Catholic law, basically. They had their teachings and their sacraments, but they, um, see, the, the, the Protestants had been coming out with these teachings. What about this? What about this? What about this? There's justification by faith as opposed to penance. There's uh, transubstantiation is symbolic. It's not literal. Um, the use of indulgences. It's repentance, not penance. Repentance is when you turn your life around and you become a different person and you leave your old life behind and start a new life. That's repentance. Penance is when you make some payment for your sin and then you just go on being the same person. Um, where it's impossible to become a different person. You, you're you just pay for your sins as you go, right? And that also involves some time in purgatory after you die because that way your relatives can help pay for your sins. The ones who are still on earth that have money, they can help pay for to get you through purgatory. So this is all extra biblical teachings that the Protestants were very much standing up against because they wanted to get back to the original gospel and what it actually is supposed to be. So the, the Council of Trent is convened and its sole purpose was to demonize and criminalize all Protestant beliefs. And they basically declared anyone who believes they went through these things one by one, and they declared anathema. Uh, what does anathema mean? It basically means condemned and excommunicated, and it's like you're going to hell. You are excommunicated from the church, thrown out of the church, and condemned and cursed. That's what anathema means. So they declared anathema, anyone who believes any of these uh, Protestant teachings, anyone who teaches any of these Protestant teachings, anyone who uh, translates the Bible into any language except Latin, anyone who prints the Bible, anyone, uh, they made a list of Protestant books uh, by, by these reformers. These books were all condemned. Anyone who possesses one, anyone who possesses a book that has no author is deemed to be the author. 
And uh, these were all um, sentences of anathema, which basically would get you burned at the stake, uh, basically would get you put on the rack or put in prison under the castle in the dungeon, chained to a wall, you know. Um, it was this kind of medieval stuff. Okay, so the Protestants um, went through a lot of persecution this way because they believed in what they were doing. And they were fighting against the, what they believed to be falsehoods, in which I agree. Now, if you, you must understand the Council of Trent is still Catholic law. It, um, even the Catholic Catechism, at, uh, which was published in 1992, the Catechism is basically the book that Catholics can use to look up anything to see what the Catholic Church tells them they should believe about it. And it reaffirms and confirms the Council of Trent. And they have never uh, um, recanted it. And all they've done is reconfirmed it at every opportunity. So it is not gone. It is very much a part of Catholic teaching, but it's just sort of covered up. It's like, it's like if a guy has a dagger and he has it inside his coat instead of hanging on the outside of his coat. It's, it's, it's very much a part of Catholicism, even today. The, about 50 years after the Council of Trent started, now the Council of Trent actually went on for about um, almost 20 years. Uh, they convened and reconvened and reconvened to go through, it was like s dozens of these scholars, Catholic scholars. They went through all these things. Now, the Council of Trent started off, be it was uh, um, started off by the German king, who was basically the ruler of Europe, the, the Rom Holy Roman Emperor. And um, he was the one who asked the Pope to convene this council to sort out the differences between Protestants and Catholics. But basically what they did was they filled the council with Catholic scholars. And the first thing they did was to say, well, anything Protestant and any Protestant uh, is out. So that was the first thing they did was they got rid of all the Protestants and then they started coming up with the rules. And every rule they went through every Protestant teaching and condemned it and made it anathema. So which is like punishable by death, basically. Um, so about 50 years after the Council of Trent started, so 30 years after it was completed, uh, they finally came out in England with the King James Bible. Um, it wasn't the first English Bible, uh, but it was the first English Bible authorized by the King of England. And uh, it had been a long road to get there, to that. It was put out by the Church of England, for the Church of England, an English Bible for the English people. So that is like a, a real landmark for Protestants. And that was the last truly Protestant Bible. Because uh, every Bible after that is a, is a counter-reformation Bible, uh, to put it very basically. And it's not that you can't um, be saved reading those Bibles. But they, uh, they're um, based on a vastly inferior manuscripts. And not only inferior manuscripts, but translated in an inferior way. Where this Bible here is basically the manuscripts that were carried by the Eastern Church. And completely translated in a very literal way. So that it takes a little bit of work to sort it out, and it's not a perfect translation, 
but it's the best one we have because every translation after that is a counter-reformation translation. The Geneva Bible was, was done shortly before the King James Bible, and that was by far the most popular Bible in English. Um, but the Geneva Bible also had a lot of um, uh, extra biblical writings on the side, like study guides that were written by the Reformers, very, very much against the papacy. And um, their teachings, they didn't know everything, but they had a pretty good idea. And, and they um, came up with a lot of stuff. It was all new to them. So we know much more about, we understand, we have a much better view now than they did because of the work that they did and because of the work that's been done on the translations and our understanding of history. And, you know, we have the internet, which is more information than the greatest library that they could ever hope for. So we have a lot more at our fingertips. Um, but because of the work they did, we have this. And very much because of the Geneva Bible, and the church of the work done by the Church of England against the papacy, because the papacy had the Inquisition, and they were very militant. And they, um, when they caught Protestants, they would basically fry them. And uh, people feared them very much, and they feared being persecuted by them. When the Inquisition would come into your town they would basically grab somebody and put them on the rack and then start tell them to start naming names. And any names he named would basically be the next person in line to go on the rack. And they, when they were done with everybody, then they would uh, mete out the punishments that they desired to. And it was basically... Uh, you know, come under the yoke of the Roman church or die. That was your choices. And people would disappear. The Inquisition would take them and, and they would never be seen again and you could never find out whatever even happened to them. Um, this is why England, the, the barons of England, came up with the uh, Magna Carta and habeas corpus because it was uh, against Rome, the, the practices of Rome, that they wanted these rights guaranteed to them to stop their uh, rising up a revolution, to accept this new king. Uh, as long as the king would sign that Magna Carta, then they wouldn't revolt. Because, and, and that's where the, a lot of these basic civil rights came from started was from the Church of England and the Protestants being afraid of what was going to happen to them with this new Catholic king. Um, now this also gave rise during the American Revolution to the American civil rights. They, they were like another extension of liberty for, that was started through that through those rights that uh, that were done through the Church of England, and it was a, a basically protections against tyranny, and the tyranny being the Roman Church. As during those times, they were a tyranny, and what happened was there was the American Revolution in 1776. And there was also uh, the French Revolution. And the French Revolution gave rise to Napoleon. <clears throat> and Napoleon uh, was uh, the king of France who, uh, starting in 1809, he basically took over the bulk of Europe by 1812. And um, he was crowned See, he sent his general into uh, Italy, into Rome, to t 
take down the papacy. And the reason why was he was uh, conquering these uh, churches through Spain and through Europe. And church after church he had conquered, um, he, he gained the, the heart of the people because these churches were under a, a severe yoke by the church. And every church had dungeons under it. And there was people in the, in the dungeons uh, being punished. And they were... Um, you know, there was like these practices like whipping yourself and, and, and you, you know, you are a sinner and there's no hope for you and, and you are only one to be punished was basically the doctrine of penance. And so people saw Napoleon as a great liberator, but Napoleon, after seeing dungeon after dungeon full of these people being treated like animals, basically, he sent his general to Rome to take down the papacy. And that's exactly what he did. The papacy was taken down. And um, it was a few years later that um, they convinced, they offered Napoleon the crown of Holy Roman Emperor. And Napoleon, he had a lot of lust for power. And so he took this uh, opportunity that the coronation of Napoleon is a very famous uh, event. But the difference is, this, this is where it kind of signifies another end of the papacy. Because up to that time, it was the Pope who always crowned the Holy Roman Emperor. They were usually uh, German kings. And there was a time when they became French kings. And it was basically up to the Pope, who was a representative of God, to crown the Holy Roman Empire. So during the coronation of Napoleon, he broke that tradition by he took the crown out of the Pope's hands and crowned himself. Um, so this was kind of the last crowning of a Holy Roman Emperor done by Napoleon to himself. He, he basically took it away from the Pope. And this was uh, another great victory of the French Revolution. Um, so this was sort of this time. And, and this time ended with, in, this is the time of judgment, the end of this era. Um, when the uh, the falsehood of Catholicism was rejected by Europe um, and America because they, they became a land of liberty and uh, the, the Bible believers uh, who were becoming most of the people uh, they were promised um, They were promised restoration. They were promised uh, at the second coming of Christ, the uh, entry into heaven, the kingdom of Jesus. This is what they their their great promise, right? And while the 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 Roman Catholic Church was kind of overthrown at that time, um, not only by the reformers but by the uh, revolutionaries, and many of these revolutionaries were. Uh, they hated religion and they saw the overthrow of the church as a great time for atheism and a great time for science and it was uh the 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 renaissance it was the the birth of modern science um the church was sort of holding science back in a lot of ways so it was the um the birth of Protestantism came, it was in, like another double-edged sword. It came with the birth of materialism and humanism. Um, and this gave um, rise to the revolutions, um, the American and the French Revolution, 
was driven by mostly by a hatred for the papists um, a throwing off of tyranny as seen by the king of England and by the popes so after this came the baptism of fire the new Christianity okay so now just as uh, Judaism had been restored even though it was corrupt Catholicism was also restored for Christ's sake that prophecy may be fulfilled there are many prophecies about the tyranny being overthrown um, it was overthrown physically but not spiritually because the people still don't understand fully what it means okay so then uh, France was ejected from Italy by Austrian troops and the Roman Republic was founded once again and the first Vatican Council was convened okay and so the popes were put back into power in Rome and in 1848 uh, the Pope issued an edict uh, claiming papal infallibility uh, that the Pope is infallible in matters of faith okay now this had always been a belief um, or you know since ancient times it had been a belief of the popes that the Pope was infallible um, but this was like the the first time it was actually explained and written out in an edict explaining what it, what papal infallibility means is that basically he can't be wrong in interpreting the Bible and he interprets it as the catechisms and they haven't recanted anything and you got to still do what he says or else that's basically what it means okay and then in 18 um, 80, 1854 the Pope comes out with another edict explaining the Immaculate Conception of Mary um, now this was a Gnostic heresy uh, that you'll find uh, a, a, a gospel that's not included in the Bible but it was written oh, about the 3rd century and it's named the gospel of mary and that's this this is from that gospel um that's not it wasn't included in the bible because it's ridiculous and it's not it's not from the bible it's it's a heresy of the third century but anyway the pope out, outlines this immaculate conception of mary in his edict in 1858 and when most people hear the Immaculate Conception, they always think it's talking about the conception of Jesus, that he was conceived by the Holy Spirit. It's not talking about the conception of Jesus. It's talking about the conception of Mary, that she was conceived in the same way by the Holy Spirit, sinless from birth, because otherwise, how could she bear Jesus? You see? So this is the, 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 the theology behind this, is Mary had to be conceived immaculately so that she could be pure enough to be the mother of God. And she came down from heaven and was born just like Jesus because she was the mother of God, right? As it makes her a God, puts her on a level of goddess. But this turns the whole gospel on its head. Because the gospel is that Jesus, God, came and was born in human flesh. And as a human in the flesh, he obeyed God in every way. He overcame sin in the flesh. Um, so that kind of throws the gospel on its head saying, well, he was born in some other kind of flesh not human flesh no he was born in human flesh the same flesh we are 
and it wasn't uh, Mary was not immaculately conceived she had a mother and father named I'm not sure if they're named in the Bible but there's nothing in the Bible or in the gospel written by the apostles about the immaculate conception of Mary that was a third century heresy okay but it also is still taught by the Roman Catholic Church where they make Mary the mother of God and a goddess in heaven, the queen of heaven, which is a pagan deity. It's, it all comes back to making the Roman deities Christian deities. Okay, that's where it sort of came from. And they're just reiterating that the Catholic Church was right and we'll never admit to do, ever doing anything wrong. And, you know... As soon as we get power over you, then you're going to find out, right? For your own good. That kind of attitude, right? So there's no recanting of old heresies, okay? Then that was in 1854, okay? Now another, con uh, another um, counter-reformation is uh, Westgar in 1881... Westcott and Hort published a new Greek manuscript, which was basically comes from two manuscripts, which are greatly um, corrupted manuscripts. These are the two oldest found manuscripts of the New Testament. They are highly corrupt, and they are not old enough, is the problem. They're, they're dated at about the 3rd century also, when there was a ton of corrupt manuscripts floating around at that time. So it doesn't prove anything. The, 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 the manuscripts carried on through the Greek church are far, there's like 5,000 of those, compared to the two that they're using to change everything. So... I would say the tradition of the Greek church is far more valid than these two manuscripts that were... One was found in the Vatican Library, of all places, and another one was found in the garbage bin in Mount Sinai in Israel, which is not even the real Mount Sinai. That, that was believed to be Mount Sinai by Constantine's mother, and it's basically the wrong place, because it's none of the events um, described in uh, the book of Exodus match the landscape of that area at all. But it was traditionally always believed to be Mount Sinai. Well, there was a monastery there, and they were basically using this manuscript for fire paper, uh, fire starters because it was considered worthless and these guys dug it out of the garbage supposedly and, and then they took these two manuscripts and put them together into one manuscript and this is their manuscript that they come up with which is where a lot of the Bible verses are removed from it and then they claim that other Bible verses were added, not Bible verses removed. But it's um, the, the Greek um, Christians did not add verses. It was the Gnostics who removed verses. And it's pretty technical stuff, but it can be proven. Um, one thing that I found that is is really good proof of this is that these removed verses if you start matching up verses from the early church fathers where they quote verses from the bible and elude, and allude to verses in the bible the, uh, before these manuscripts or before the third century you go through all the church fathers and they can match up these supposedly added verses being quoted by the earliest church fathers. So 
they were not added, they were removed. And so this has the verses not removed, basically. And it's just a counter-reformation. Every Bible after the King James is based upon this new manuscript. And it's also a different uh, type of translation where they call it, uh, what's it called, dynamic it's a dynamic translation where it's like, we're not going to translate exactly what it says. We're just going to tell you what it means. Okay? Get it? Isn't that enough? Um, we're okay. We're going to tell you what it means. We're not going to tell you what it actually says. I'd rather know what it actually says and figure out what it means. I, I don't mind doing the work. Okay, now, the reign of Charlemagne, which was started in 800 AD, the first Holy Roman Empire, his reign was said to have lasted a thousand years, from Charlemagne up to the last Holy Roman Empire, Napoleon. Okay, this was the glorious thousand-year rule of the Roman Catholic Church and the Holy Roman Emperor. And this is known in Germany as the First Reich. Reich means reign or rule. The First Great Reich, the thousand year glorious rule of people who like to burn people at the stake and boil them in oil and rip them apart with machines. Um, and force force them to follow a false gospel and use violence to keep them from reading the real gospel this this glorious reign okay now so that was the first Reich okay so after has West gotten hurt 19 to 1914 to 1918, for the First World War, was the Second Reich. Um, basically, when Germany tried to conquer France. See, when Charlemagne died, he was the emperor over all of Europe. And when he died, Europe was basically divided into three sections to go to his three sons. And this is where we get, basically, Germany, Italy, and France. Okay? And this is why they all have contentions with each other ever since then. Germany and France, Germany and France, and Italy's got their part in it. It's always because they're all fighting over who gets to rule Europe. Because it's, it's the glorious thousand-year rule, remember? They, who gets to be the leader of it, right? So World War I is when uh, Germany attacked France, and surrounded Paris, and it was a stalemate, a trench warfare around Paris. So that was the Second Reich, World War II. That was the Third Reich, okay? Symbolism will be their downfall. And you take a look at the symbolism of the Nazis and the SS. They have the, you look at the Pope, the Pope's got swastikas on his collar. They, they got that Maltese cross that sort of goes like this, you know, like that kind of cross. The Nazis wore it right there, just like on their throat, right? Just like the priest has a white collar on his throat. It's got to do with all, all your speech comes through this purity, right? Um, so their symbolism is their downfall. The, the SS was, was modeled directly after the Jesuit order. Um, there's many books about it. And then at the end of the war, um, there was the Operation Paperclip where... See, the Nazis had been doing many experiments on the prisoners. Um, 
medical experiments and cruel, inhumane experiments. But they had, and they, and they also uh, were very uh, good at um, technology. They had invented the rocket. They invented the jet engine. They had the, the by far the highest technology. The, the Americans and British had to catch up to them. Um, I think the Americans and British got ahead of them with radar. But as far as rocket engines and jet engines and stuff like that, and medical and mind control, the Germans were far ahead. Now, after the war, the problem became, well, uh, we got to get a hold of this uh, knowledge before the, the Nazis were well known for, for going all over collecting occultic knowledge. The occult, black magic, anything they could get their hands on, they experimented with it. Uh, seances, you name it, anything, witchcraft, any kind of knowledge, they experimented to see if it would actually work. And if it did, they would use it, right? And they also did medical experiments and, and all kinds of ugly stuff. Well, what after the war, the importance of national security became, well, who gets all this knowledge, um, the Russians or the Americans? Uh, so Operation Paperclip was, was the American intelligence agency bringing all these scientists into America. Hi, the battery died on my camera. So uh, I'm going to finish this video off. It's probably going to be about another half hour. That makes this a two hour video, but uh, well, I've got time to make it. I'm sure people have time to listen to it. Okay, so the next thing to think about is that after the fall of the Nazi regime, there was also the Nazi rat, rat lines to Argentina. Uh, this is another thing that can be researched quite easily is uh, they had all these Nazi officers and, and people connected to the Nazi party that needed to get out of Germany fast because the war was over. The Allies had uh, already taken Berlin and they were in a lot of trouble. And the uh, Vatican was supplying uh, identification to these people and travel and getting them out of Germany and taking them to Argentina and probably some other places. Argentina uh, was a pro-Nazi country at the time. It was the perfect escape for these people. And uh, the Nazi party actually continued in Argentina. Uh, there's a good movie about how Mossad took um, the spy agency of Israel um, kidnapped Eric Eichmann out of Argentina and made him stand trial in Israel. It's a true story. And they show the, the, the Nazi party quite active in Argentina. It probably still is, who knows. Um, but at that time, they were smuggled out of Argentina. And you can also look up uh, the, the Yustashi. These were um, the people running Yugoslavia at the time. Um, and it was a, uh, um, can't remember exactly what order, I think it was a Franciscan order that was given charge over Yugoslavia. And the uh, Eastern Orthodox Christians and the Muslims who lived there were being slaughtered en masse by the military being run by this Franciscan order. Uh, you can research that also. It's called the Eustachi. They were worse than the Nazis. They were so brutal and so inhumane that they actually made the Nazis sick. And so that's another thing that people can look up. 
So after um, that, let's see, I don't want to spend too much time. See, from the time of World War II on, um, researching history becomes quite, mu quite a lot more difficult because this, even the spy agencies today, the, the Five Eyes, uh, all the worldwide spy agencies, Mossad and MI6 and CIA and what have you, they all have a stake in certain things from World War II. So even today, there's secrets that they don't want people to talk about or to know about. So um, that's where history starts to become a little bit more difficult to dig into, um, f especially for this kind of stuff that exposes organizations like the Vatican or like the Americans bringing the scientists in and things like that going on um, but it it there are papers that are uh, available and there are books written that can be found about it um, what I say is to just take a look at the big picture look at actions actions speak louder than words and the symbolism is also very important. They share the same symbolism. So just, just to take a look at the general actions that have happened. After this, we have the... Um, now, when America was founded and the British uh, Parliament um, began it, it's very much based now on the freedom of the individual. That was, uh, the old age was the age of kings and popes, where they had what was referred to as the right of kings. And the right of kings is a Christian principle that basically says, God decides who the king is, and if you're not listening to the king, then you're not listening to God. So this is the right of kings. And the pope would crown the king. Um because he was the Pope representing God, putting the crown on the king. So the people were expected and even forced to obey the will of the king, because to obey the king is to obey God. This is the way it was. Um, the American um, Declaration of Independence addresses the right of kings, um, just as some of the reformers had done already, saying, when the king, uh, God places kings above men uh, to rule over them justly. But when the king becomes a tyrant, it is not only the right, it is the duty of men to overthrow him and to install a just king. So this is, uh, if, if the, I guess I can't quote it directly right now, but the Declara Declaration of Independence lays this out pretty well. All men are born equal with certain inalienable rights, and it is their duty to overthrow tyrannical governments. Um, this comes from addressing the right of kings. So <clears throat> this was the change that happened in the world. Um, from the time of uh, the American and French revolutions. Now, uh, the change that happened from the time of the Second World War is that now Britain used to be the superpower at that time, and France was a superpower, and Germany, right? Well, Germany overthrew France, and then Britain was the naval superpower, so Germany could not take care of Britain no matter how hard they tried and Britain also had the uh, colonies of Canada that they were called dominions at that time Canada Australia India South Africa they had colonized all these dominions and so they had all these resources to bring to bear against Germany um, it was very much a submarine warfare against the shipping uh, the shipping lanes between Canada and Britain was one of the biggest shipping lanes and the, 
the German rat packs, they called them, of submarines used to uh, sink the ships going from Nova Scotia to Britain. And then when the U.S. got into that war, then the U.S. became the superpower after winning the World War II. And they got all the scientists and they got all the technology and they have been the superpower ever since. So now the next thing to think about is, okay, now what did the, the Roman Catholic Church do after this happened? Well, now they had uh, what was called... Um, in 1962, they came up with the Second Vatican Council. It's called Vatican II. And what happened was the, they were losing people by the thousands of uh, coming to their church because the Mass was always in Latin and people didn't understand it and people were turning to Protestant because it just made so much more sense, you know, than going to this Latin Mass at, this ritual, and it was um, such a such an easy choice for people that Vatican II decided to uh, allow the Mass to be uh, spoken in the languages of different nations. This is something they had fought the Reformation over. Um, they had burned people at the stake for this, but now they were allowing it. And... Also, um, they uh, never admitted to any wrongdoing whatsoever. They never have. And Vatican II reiterates and confirms the Council of Trent as wonderful. And um, it also kicked off the ecumenical movement. And the first thing they did was they invited the Protestants, who they called separated brethren, to come back to the mother church, saying, oh, you're the separated brethren. You should come back to the mother church. We can all sing Kumbaya together. And they also kicked off the ecumenical movement, reaching out to all religions of the world, to come together as one religion. And at the same time as this, the globalism started to grow. Um, the, the European Union, the, the gathering of nations. Um, because after World War II, the Americans and the British and, and the French and other allies had formed the NATO and um, the United Nations had formed, bringing uh, rules of war and crimes against humanity and all of these new um, world entities had begun. And so now also this Vatican world entity thing started with gathering all the religions into one and also getting involved with the EU and with world government. And you'll see the Pope now is always pushing world government, open borders, um, world religion and all this stuff and, and propping himself as the leader of it all, right? So this is sort of what their, their modus operandi is now since World War II. Now, um, they've also, um, the, the, the Protestants nowadays um, are not the same as the Protestants of olden days. They, now they all are with the ecumenical movement and with um, having a more universal flavor of Christianity and the the seminaries are are basically run by these um, open border globalist type people so every priest who goes or every pastor who goes to seminary gets taught all this stuff and it's not really um 
the uh, raw Christianity, it's not foundational to Christianity to be friends with the world like this. Um, I'm not going to dive into it because that could be a whole nother hour, but I think most people can understand that. Is uh, to be friends with the world is uh, the world is against God in many ways, and you know you have to live in the world. But being friends and buddies with the world is quite a different thing, right? Okay. So uh, there's the ecumenical movement. Um, the destruction of Libya was a, a, a huge event. Um, that was done, they had the coalition to prevent Gaddafi uh, from bombing his people. So they, the, the coalition was going to set up a no-fly zone so that Gaddafi would not bomb his own people. But this, as soon as they got there, the first thing they did was they started to bomb the Libyan people. They bombed the whole country. They bombed it to the Stone Age. And this is what caused the African migration. The, uh, they call it the Syrian migration, but they're not Syrians. Uh, the Syrians migrated, yeah, that happened for a couple of months. But then from Africa, millions and millions and millions of people were coming calling themselves Syrians. And this is the African migration into Europe and into Canada and other places. Um, so this, this is... I think, the, I think the reason, the main reason behind that being done is to weaken the West, to, to weaken the free nations, because our education system is weak. We're, kids aren't being taught what freedom really is or what the history of freedom is. And uh, they're, they're pouring immigrants in who don't understand the West like Westerners do. And also Westerners are taking it for granted. So it's getting weaker and weaker and weaker. And this is being done systematically because at one time it's going to fall if, if things don't change. And there are a lot of people in the world who would love nothing better than for the West to fall because of neglect. Like, for example, the European Union. The, the, the head people in the European Union are not elected. They're bureaucrats and they're socialists. Like, who, nobody elected these people. Who are they? And, and wh why are they telling us what to do? Why is Ch China telling us what to do? China is a communist dictatorship. It doesn't mean we shouldn't deal with China, but we should know the difference between a communist dictatorship and a free country. There is a big difference. Um, you know, so more could be done than what is being done. And the last thing I'd like to say is that, you know, a lot of this stuff talking about the Vatican, um, people tend to start hating on Catholic people. Catholic people don't know all this stuff. They, they're not a part of it. They're... Um, most of them are just born and raised in the church and they go to church every Sunday and they have their circles of friends and the last thing on their mind is this kind of stuff but it's the upper echelons the, the, of, at the Vatican and other places that are working on this stuff and they're just using the support of the people who support them it's uh, every secret, secret society works this way. It's like Freemasons. The top Freemasons are doing some, something quite different than the bottom Freemasons are doing. But the bottom Freemasons are there to feed the pyramid. It's a pyramid structure. So they're, so they're all sending their dues and supporting the, the, the capstone at the top of the pyramid. But what this 
top of the pyramid is doing is a completely different thing than what what they all think it's doing. So it's the same thing. It's they they all a lot of them work this way. So that sort of sums up prophecy without diving into all the scriptures. And this is just to set things up because the next video we're going to start talking about prophecy and it almost kind of jumps into this right away a little bit. And um, so I just wanted to give you this preview and this tee up of it because it makes it easier to not have to keep explaining it over and over again what this all is talking about. But you will see as we go how it does talk about this. It's the, the evil. Um, a perfect example I'm going to very brief, briefly talk about is most uh, Protestant Christians now will talk about the rapture. Oh, the rapture is coming. The great rapture, when the man of sin will be revealed. The, the Antichrist is coming. They see the Antichrist as this coming thing. And they get it mostly from uh, a scripture in Second Thessalonians chapter 2 where the Apostle Paul talks about this man of sin who will be revealed, this Antichrist. Um, actually, he will be revealed doesn't mean that he wasn't here before. There are many other scriptures that talk about he's already here. Even back then, he was already there. He's always been on earth. He, um, the Antichrist is already there. He's been working all along. He's been setting up his kingdom on earth the whole time. He will be revealed means that he's a deceiver and he will be exposed for what he really is. That is the revealing of the man of sin. So it's not like uh, an antichrist who wasn't here, who is going to be born and shows up all of a sudden. It's an entity that has been here all along. That's the difference. Um, that's just another thing that was put out in the Protestant community that gets everybody thinking about something else other than what the reformers started with. And they were not wrong. They just, they were, they only knew the beginning. They didn't know what would happen after them. Where we do, we have a better picture than they did to see what did happen after them. So, uh, we'll see you in the next video. We're going to start on Genesis chapter 48 in the next video uh, where Jacob blesses his two sons, or Israel. Israel blesses his two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh. I'll see you in the next video.